don't have a, don't normally do this, but uh, we're going to have a vote for a moment. Who is anyone a little bit more on the chilly side this morning? Is anyone feeling a little cool? If that's you, can you raise your hand? All right, cool, great, good. If you think it's like it's just comfortable, it's just wonderful, it's just like don't touch the heating, the cooling, whatever else. Raise your hand. Yep, thanks. <laughs> You have just affirmed me like you would not believe, all you wonderful people. <laughs> oh, turn your neighbour and say, God is good. Can you just give me just two chords? Just two, so I don't move around too much. Just a G and a C or something like that. Sweet. Oh. Did you like the new song? Yes. Isn't it good? I love songs that remind us of the goodness of God. Uh, so often I feel sometimes we move from a ministry base that's about, I've had a tough week versus moving us to a position of knowing you are a person of faith that God is with. And I believe it's, there is a move in our region and a move in atmosphere, even in the climate of our church that we are moving to a people of faith who speak to circumstances. Jesus says that uh, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can speak to this mountain and it shall move. Everyone say move. Everyone say move. There are things in your life that you're going to learn to speak to that are going to move. That as we, I, as we get ready for... We're about weeks away, oh, weeks, well, maybe two, still three months away from moving premises. But I feel again that it is significant in what God is wanting to do, not just us as a congregation, but you as an individual. In the outworking of who you are, in again, I love the, the other word that is used to describe us as Christians. It's called believer. A believer means you believe something. You have a substance, you have a foundation. I'm not sure why I'm here this morning. I'm not even close to my notes. But uh, just, I just have a sense of, again, there's this, there, there, there is something that God wants to do in you and I, inside of all of us. Just for a moment, I'm going to ask you all to stand again, please, if you wouldn't mind, just for a few minutes. For those of you who are online and watching us this morning, great to have you here with us. You might want to even stand wherever you are, in your lounge room or etc. Uh, if you're watching this later and you're driving your car, please make sure you stay driving your car. But if that's you in particular this morning, I'm going to ask all eyes closed across this building. But if, there's a, if you know that there's a, a, a shift that you know you need to make to go, you know what? I'm going to be that person who speaks to my stuff, who speaks to my circumstance, because I am a believer. I will not let this thing, mind thing, whatever it is that's trying to have a go at you right now, if you right now know that you are going to go, I'm making that shift. In fact, even when I was praying this morning, I can't wait for uh, the, the series we're going to do in our connect groups next term, next month. Uh, and, and I felt like this, it's, it's like it's to go to war. It's a people who are willing to go to war in the sense of who's God made them to be and their circumstances. So if that's you and you know you need to make that shift, it's like God is stirring that inside of you right now. Could you just lift both hands to the Lord, close your eyes. Just lift both your hands to God right now and say, God, I'm, I, that's, I'm moving to that place. I'm moving to that place. I'm, I'm a warrior, in, so to speak, in your hands. I, I want to be that person of strength. I see that your word fills me with faith, that it fills me with, with something that grants me a substance that speaks to circumstances, that prophesies even to people's lives, prophesies to things around me. Because God, you've put breath, you've put life in me. You said to the disciples, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. So now go in my name and use it. My name, which isn't a name of authority. So God, I pray for every person here, those you see right now with their hands lifted in this place. God, that even in this next week, as they, they feel a call to pray. They feel literally a call to, to separate themselves, to, whether it's to move into a different room or to go to a beach or even go to their car and just flick the worship music up but a place where they can with their mouths declare, my God is going to move on my behalf. My God is favours me. My God is going to work these things out for good. 
I am more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. And if you know that was for you, say Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a praise offering in this place today. God, You are good. Love endures forever. You are incredible. Awesome. Wow. All right, I think I've got that out of my system. You can sit down now. Thanks. Laurie, you can sit down now too. Thank you very, very much. It's just what I needed. Oh. I love praying. And I can't encourage you enough that of all things to discipline into your life. Um, I would love to say it's just something you just do out of natural, but I appreciate what it is to be a believer. And there are certain disciplines that we have to create as habits into our life to discover then the life that they put into you. Uh, I never, it's, it's such a terrible expression to put it like this, but prayer is like a drug. Because prayer is not just this little moment of five minutes of silence or, or whatever. I believe that there's a prayer life where, you, again, you discover what it is to feel like today you moved a mountain. I believe there is a prayer life that you can have in your life that, um, that feels like today you stepped into the same room where God was literally waiting for you with His presence, with His well done, good and faithful servant. And of all things that I would want for any person who calls this place their home is that you would know a prayer life that, 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 that causes you to be on fire, to live with a fire deep in your heart and in your life to know again that God indeed is good. So one more time, could you turn your neighbour for me and say, our God indeed is good. Indeed. All right. I said, I think I've got that out of my system. Uh, we've been doing a series on love serving and, and today is my last one as we prepare. Like next week is Easter, everybody. Oh my goodness, it is Easter. It is the weekend where we celebrate Christ. history changed because of Easter. History changed because of what Christ done. Now it's quite incredible. We're already at over 220 registered people to be here for next Sunday. Who thinks that's exciting? Yeah. All right. Now, as you've heard, the rules have changed. The, the government in the, in the name of, thankfully, I'm a shoot, they didn't mention anything about Easter, but I'm going to believe it's because they wanted to bless the churches in lead up to Easter, is that we can now have up to a 75% capacity of the room or 250 people in the room, whichever is less. So uh, I'm going to be sending out an electronic invite later on this afternoon. And if you haven't yet invited your friend to church, and that's an easy way for you to invite somebody, or if that's a way that you know can work for you, um, that's going to hopefully be in your inbox today. If you're not already a, a Facebook friend of me personally, Brian Weber, look for me on Facebook. That way I can mess inbox you. It's a lot easier to do, etc. So if you haven't already done that. Also, I mind it while I say that, we have a C3 Church Devonport Facebook site where also the invitation is on that. If you're not yet signed up to our Facebook page, can I encourage you, like our page, get onto it. And uh, there we do a mix of things, including keep you up to date with what's going on, celebrating some of the things that's been happening in the life of our church, and even using it for some discipleship moments along the way. Uh, again, our, one of the true norths of C3 church, C3s across the world, as Pastor Phil Pringle would put it, is that our true north is to see souls won to Christ. Is that those that have become lost, those who don't yet know Christ, those who don't yet know the eternity of heaven versus an eternity of hell, that, that, that we would be active in that mission as churches to see people coming to Christ. And serving, I believe, in, particularly in the nation of Australia, in our culture, that serving is one of the most simplest forms of evangelism that you and I can embrace. Christ gave us the great commissions in both Matthew 28 and Mark 16. He says, to go therefore and make disciples. Everyone say make. make. If you were here last week, I said, God doesn't leave you where you are. He wants to make you. He wants to make you into everything He created you to be. And make disciples of all nations. Help the people to learn of me, believe in me and obey my words. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And then in Mark chapter 16, and then he told them, go. Everyone say, go. Go into all the world, preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptised will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. Today, I want to give focus to the outworking of this great commission, which I don't believe is just for certain people. It's not just for what a, a biblical name evangelists. 
The idea of an evangelist, what is an evangelist? Someone who natural has an, just this natural ability to just take the gospel to whoever is wanting and willing to listen, whoever comes even near them. But the, the mission also, there is a position of an evangelist to equip every believer to be an evangelist, to work in that point that we might use what God has put in us, our giftings, our abilities, our message, our journey, our story, that we might serve others as the way of, that they might know God sees them, values them, and wants them to have the same thing. The way Jesus served people is significant. He met people at their point of need. He served their need. Whether it was a physical healing, whether it was setting people literally free from demonic bondages, whether it was just even having thousands of people in front of him who realised that they needed a meal before they went back home and would perform a miracle literally just to serve their need of an appetite. But there's also other ways that Christ simply served a need. And one of my favourite pieces of history is about a moment with Jesus and a guy by the, let's just say a guy I feel like I have some level of affinity with. Only in one way though might I state. He was vertically challenged. (laughs) There is a piece of history about a guy by the name of Zacchaeus. He is known as someone who who was short. He was uh, vertically challenged. Um, But the thing about Zacchaeus was that he had an occupation that made him hated amongst his own people. You see, he worked for the empirical government. He worked for the, the, the empirical rulers who had oppressed the Jewish people. And he worked for them in a way as a tax collector. And it made him absolutely hated And to take some poetic license, as Deb so well put it this morning, I wondered how I could find a way to help us understand how despised Zacchaeus was. And I thought, what kind of role in Devonport is absolutely despised? (coughs) There it is. So imagine the parking meter person. But they're not giving you a fine of... $8 $8 or whatever it is right now. I don't even know what it is. Oh, sorry, what is it? Oh, it's, oh, oh, it's gone up. I've got a mate who literally just moved down from Sydney just recently. And he, he, we got chatting when he first arrived and he says, what's the deal with everybody in parking down here? I can show you in places in Sydney where it's $100 an hour. Well, imagine a parking fine of not $20 or $30 or even $80 or even $100 an hour. Imagine a parking fine of $10,000. One, two, three. Ooh. Now that would be a sting. And Zacchaeus though had the ability and the power to do exactly that. That even though this might be the charge of $80 or whatever else, he had the power to way overcharge. Of like in that range of like the $10,000. And he was the kind of guy who would cheat about it. So you know that moment where you arrive at the parking meter and, and that, that literally is like, it's two minutes, but you've arrived two minutes late. And now they're printing out the ticket and you know right now is that moment you're appealing your case. Like, I'm sorry, I'm printing out the ticket. Who's ever had one of those moments? <laughs> oh, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> I was going to say, who actually then convinced them to not give it to you? I don't reckon anybody in the room from what I've seen. But he doesn't just do it two minutes after. He's got like this little magnet that he carries around in his pocket. And he goes around from parking meter to parking meter. And he has one of those magnets and all of a sudden it makes it go from like you've got free, you've got parking. Suddenly it's expired. And then he goes, slaps the thing on there. And you come in and go like, but I know I had extra time. What's the meter? I say, mate, what's the meter? Zacchaeus was hated. Hated it amongst his people because of how he did this. He had a Roman army to even back it up so he could do pretty much whatever he wanted. But he has this moment where he's, it's not like he's not familiar with faith. It's not like he doesn't, it's not like he's not known of it. But his life choices have meant he's been rejected from it. 
His life choices has been, he's been rejected from people and rejected from those of his own faith. And, and again, to, to take some poetic license, it's a little bit like as if Jesus came into Devonport at Christmas time. And everyone, I assume everyone here has been to the Christmas parade. So you've seen the crowds of people who just flock along the side of the road to try and see. You know, if you're, if you're a parent, you'd be that person who, if you've arrived late, you know the problem that it is. If you've arrived late with your kids, you're relying on the kind and goodness and gentleness of those who are standing on the side of the road that when you ask them, would you please let me push my pram in here? Prams are a great way. They were always an easy winner. Prams were always a way to go, oh, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. But your three-year-old, five-year-old, maybe not. But the pram, there was something about the pram that always got you through the other side, wasn't there? But you're relying on that goodness of people to let you get into the front row so that you can see the parade as it's coming through. Well, Jesus is coming through in front of this parade. And everybody's heard about the healings, the miracles, the incredible ways that He has served people's needs. And Zacchaeus, he's arrived a bit late. He had about five parking metres in a row that he was having too much fun with and forgot what time it was. But he finally gets to the parade and he realises, oh my goodness, I just wanted to see Jesus. I just wanted. But he tries to push in, but no one. He, he should have just brought a pram. If he'd brought a pram, he'd have been... No. He, he, he tries to get through the crowd. He tries to, but no one. So it says, well, I can see where this line is going. So it says he races ahead of all the people. And he climbs up to the top of this tree to be able to see actually over it. And as he's standing there, he notices the crowd is coming closer and closer and closer. And he's just trying to peer through the branches to see if he can even work out which one Jesus is amongst this crowd. But then all of a sudden, as he hears the noise and the roar of the crowd, all of a sudden the crowd just stops. They're not moving any longer. They've stopped underneath the tree. And in stopping underneath the tree, Zacchaeus suddenly hears this voice. Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Jesus stands under the tree of this guy who has been rejected. Stands underneath the tree of this guy who's been disassociated from everybody. And he does one thing, just one simple thing. He goes, he invites himself to his house for a meal. I wonder how long it had been since someone of his tribe, of his people, had given such honour to Zacchaeus. To host someone in your home of, oh well, mate, um, this might go down the wrong way, but I'll try it anyway. Imagine if the Prime Minister invited himself to your home. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I thought I heard a few people. <laughs> but imagine if someone of that level of importance in our nation invited themselves. What would that say to you about who you are and their want to know more about you? What would it mean if the Prime Minister himself of our country came to your home to say, I've heard about, I just, I just want to come and hear your story it says in this moment now remember all Jesus has done is gone to this guy's house all he's done is sat there to experience a meal with him but listen to what Zacchaeus says but Zacchaeus said to the, said to every to the Lord and to everyone there look Lord here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor and if I have cheated anybody out of anything I will pay back four times the amount in other words in just a moment Zacchaeus turns his life around in just a moment Zacchaeus says I realize I'm working for the wrong guys and he realizes I've done the wrong thing and he recognises that with the wealth, the excess, the things that he's been able to attribute, that he will do what is the gospel thing to do, what his faith thing is to do. It is part of our faith to look after the poor. So Zacchaeus puts himself about that. And then the next thing he's gone, and I realise I've cheated people. I realise I've gone around those, those parking meters. I've put down the 10,000 fines. I'm paying them back four times as much. Anybody right now at a $10,000 fine be going like, I'm getting $40,000, Yeah! Listen to what Jesus replies to Zacchaeus in this moment. Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. 
For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. The Son of Man, Jesus. Jesus has come to, to seek those, not those who are already comfortable in our faith, but those who don't yet know faith. And the incredible omission that he gave to us is that we are now to be him to people. If it was his mission to seek and save the lost, then surely it is the mission of the church, us, to seek and save the lost. But the way we do that is not necessarily put some big tent somewhere around our city and, and have some guest speaker. It's not putting on the most flashiest thing that our town can come to. It's just simply identifying the needs of people around us and finding a way to serve them. You know, so much of even what we do here with our church service is built around the winning of the lost. We, as so much of what we do here right now is literally about that ability uh, you've heard us describe it, that Sundays is about the pathway of love God. Everyone say love God. love God. Our heartbeat in what we do here, yes, is to inspire those who already believe to love God more. But for those, if you don't yet know Christ, that like us, that you might choose the same, that you might find that one of the greatest keys to life is to fall in love with God. Is to realise He first fell in love with us. Gave His Son Christ as we celebrate next week that we might know forgiveness of sin. That we might know forgiveness of the of a feeling of punishment for that which we have done wrong. That we might indeed experience peace in this life. Not in, a, not, not in eternity, before even eternity. That you might know peace before God. That you might even know His favour is for you. So therefore, we've designed what we do here intentionally. It, well, in line with even some research about us as Australians. It says in Australia, a group by the name of the Natural, National Church Life Survey, NCLS. About 2016, some of us rep participated in a research document about this very thing, which we're going to do again sometime this year. Well, NCLS research has shown that the majority of decisions for people coming to Christ to become a Christian are being done so in the context of Sunday church and youth groups. So if this is one of the main vehicles of seeing people actually make the decision to say, I'm in, I'm becoming a Christian, then surely we need to give attention to how that looks here on our Sundays. And so therefore, in our ask of love, of love serving and this doc, this piece of paper that many of you have got on your um, chairs, I'm going to be asking you about some questions about this as we go through to help you understand again what it means for us to serve to see others know Christ. And there is a way that we've even designed out serving here that people again, oh, let me put it like this. When was the last time you ever went somewhere where you knew nobody? And I'm not just talking like a handful of people. I'm talking like a crowd. Do you remember what it felt like? I, I, I am, as a minister of religion, I get asked to do weddings. And I was a chaplain in a school for a while and I had all these teachers asking me to do their weddings. And the thing was, I, yeah, I would know the couple more often than not who were getting married. But everybody else at the wedding... I'm literally writing down just the names of the bridal party and the names of the, bride's mom, uh, the bride and groom's mum and dad, just so I can at least like I've done the basics. But when you're walking into a room and, and suddenly you're the person on the microphone in front of everybody else, let alone hanging out at their reception afterwards, when you don't know anybody, I can remember all the questions that go through my head. <gasps> Do you think they'll, they'll like the message that I've brought for today? Do you think they'll like my suit? Will it fit in? Because there's some expensive suits looking around here right now. And I'm not sure mine's as classy as theirs. Questions like, um, what are they going to do when they realise that I'm not just a um, celebrant, but I'm a pastor? Do you know how often I have conversations with people and I tell them I'm a pastor and all of a sudden the conversation goes dead? <laughs> so I've got all those nerves going through my brain whenever I go to something that's, that's like that. And maybe for you, you, I don't know, can you remember that? 
Imagine what it's like for people who have never been to church in their life and whether at an invitation or something they saw on a web or just a life circumstances that said, you know what, I need to go to church. And now walking into this room going, can you imagine what's going through their head? In fact, there might be some of you here today who go like, yeah, I thought that. I wonder if the fact like, oh, ooh, what am I supposed to wear to church? Do they wear suits? There was an era where if when you went to church, you wore a suit. So there might be still some thinking in your head, oh, I'm supposed to wear a suit. Can I wear my Ugg boots to church? Yes. <laughs> or what if you're someone, you know, who you swear a lot and, then you go, and you're thinking like, oh, I'm going into a church and I swear a lot, but oh, what if I let out a swear word? What will they think? And if you've ever been somewhere new as well, it's, it's, we do this with people we know, let alone with people we don't know. But you know that look that you get every so often, that sideways look that comes out of the side of their, head, of their face, and you just go, oh, they just glared at me. I wonder what they were thinking. I bet they were judging me. If you know that feeling and you're online, just to click a little amen. Yeah, I know what he's talking about. <laughs> so let's face it. If that's their experience from the moment of the car park all the way into the point when they're sitting here and they've got all those kind of anxious thoughts going through their head. I put, used to talk about this with a youth group I used to run all the time. And I said, I can tell you exactly what it's like. They'll be sitting here and they'll have their arms crossed and they'll be kind of still looking around. They won't be able to concentrate on what's going on because they'll still be wondering, oh, I wonder what all these people think of me. They're just judging me. Who thinks they're going to hear the gospel? But what if, but what if, what if from the moment, what if from the moment someone arrives in the car park, or the moment they're heading towards our initial gate, they see a friendly, welcoming, just loving face. There's a question literally on the back of this card that, that I'm going to be asking you to fill out shortly. And it says, how are you wired? And one of the ones that it actually says, am I, a friend? I am a friendly face. You know, we, we do this on purpose, that between the car park and our front door. You know, if you're someone who's just, you're just people orientated. You just love that initial greeting. You're not worried about meeting people. You know, there are some people, you know, and it's okay. That's again, why we, church is team. It's not just individuals. It is team. And it's why not everyone goes on the same roster and has a rotation. Because we appreciate that everyone's built different. And so therefore, there are some people who are naturally just, they just can't wait to meet people. They can't wait to be that first smiling face. Just ask my dad, Sparrow. <laughs> and if he hasn't also given you the handshake of bread at the same time, if it's not bread, we know it's the carton of eggs. Just so you know, you can still get them. They're now on the exit on your way out for anybody who's still wanting to get your <laughs> eggs and your bread. They're at the door on the way out. And so therefore, again, it's why we ask us as a church that that when people arrive, that when new people are here, that that it's our mission to then help them feel comfortable when they're here in the room. And speaking about the room, it's why we have teams that are on what we call, refer to as hospitality. Because uh, it's one of the reasons why we ask on here, are you a details person? I've got this little detail side of me that comes out occasionally. Maybe more than occasionally, as my wife just referred to. But we ask you about that because we go like, would you help us set the room up? Because again, like, let's, so we've got people who are, who are detail orientated and it's like it's, they do everything through the weekend, particularly here on Sundays. Whether it's getting the vacuum cleaner out and cleaning up the floor and making it look decent. Whether it's setting up the chairs so they all look neat and presentable so you know where to sit whether it's making sure the urns are on so that when you go for that first tea or coffee, it's like, oh, it's not cold, it's warm. And that's going to be really relevant in about another three more months. Hey, everybody. Getting close to winter. I can't wait. I've got a whole series even planned about that. I can't wait for next term. Anyway, I never get excited about what's going on at all. But all of that goes into, again, because there's something about creating something that's presentable. There's something about arriving into a place that's been neat, that's been cared for, that's, but you can tell people love 
this place because of the way they care for it. So a person who's arrived in the car park, they've met friendly faces. They've been here at the door meeting more friendly faces. They get even through the ramp, there's even more friendly faces. To the point though that they arrive in a building and go like, oh, wow, you know, it's all neat, smells nice, the people smell nice. (laughs) I'll tell you one of the lines I just had in my head. If you want to serve someone, just simply put on some deodorant. (laughs) That naughty pastor. It's why we do the music the way we do it. It's why we ask, are you creative? Are you musical? Because when I've got someone to that point where they've, you know what, they've, they've, they've met friendly faces, they've met faces that smile at them, that welcome them. They arrived into a place where they can feel the fact, see the fact, feel comfortable in it because it's being cared for. And then they hear the 10 o'clock, this music that comes on. In fact, it looks like a band. There's no pipe organ, something from like 200 years ago. Not saying there's anything wrong with a pipe organ, but it was a 200 years ago thing. Okay. The fact that there's drums. You know, that's still debated in some places. Can you or can't you have drums? Why would you still be debating that? The fact that we have speakers. And I think we're getting good at keeping the volume levels okay. I think. We try to do that well. And they hear songs that have got words, again, not from 200 years ago. Not these and thous. But words they relate to. In fact, the fact that there actually are words on a screen. Matt Thompson, well done. Great job on the words this morning. Let's give Matt a huge round of applause. All of our people who do our words for us. In fact, that's one area in particular that if you can help us out, if you think you could just simply, you know, you don't have to do much other than click words over and keep them in time with the music. That's one role in particular. If you can help us out, please let us know. We would love to have you involved in that area. But then the sound of a team who've practiced through the week, that they've given time to their skill and their ability to play together. So that, that together that we create an atmosphere And it's why we ask you then, even as a congregation, it's not just our music team's effort, but it's our effort to clap. (laughs) To clap along to the songs. And to be a bit Pentecostal in the sense that, yes, it's okay to raise our arms here. We might think, oh, but what will strangers think of that? I've seen concerts. You go to, there's concerts that you watch online, and I can tell you, the whole group of people, they've got their hands in the air. They don't have an issue with it. When it's that kind of song, they've got their torches, their flashlights, their whatever, and they're going like this. They're not, they're, it's not going to freak them out. And we do all of this so that they might even in a moment experience God. So that, but then it comes time to someone like me or whoever it is who stands in our pulpit and say, would you like to give your life to Christ? They've been able to tune in. They've been able to hear the message because they're no longer worrying about what someone else thinks. They're not even any longer worried about what God thinks. You know, there's a piece of history in the Bible. Again, another one of my, kind of another one of my favorites. In Genesis chapter 28, and it's about a guy by the name of Jacob. Jacob's a guy who's done a whole lot of things wrong. He, he's, but he, and it's funny how God works. Because even though this Jacob's done a whole heap of things wrong, he's done a whole heap of things wrong to the point of put it this way. He's running, in the scene that I'm about to talk to you about, he's literally running away from his twin brother who is threatening to kill him. Needless to say, he's done some stuff. And he's running away and in the process of running away, it says in Genesis 28 and verse 11, it says that when this guy Jacob, when he reached a certain place... He stopped for the night because the sun had set. And taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. 
And you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. Verse 16, and it says, When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely, surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. Verse 17, and it says, And he was afraid and said, How awesome this place. This is none other than the house of of God, this is the gate of heaven. Jacob, I know it, it, it's not a house of God like we might be able to say it. It's not a house of God in that context, but he's understanding that where God is, this is the house of God. And in the house of God, I think there's another thing that determined for him to understand that he was in the house of God. It wasn't a God who told him off and told him about all the wrong things he'd done. It was a God who declared into his future. It was a God who declared to the promise that if you would give your life to me, Jacob, that if you will follow my instructions, I will bring you to this place and bless you. The house of God is always meant to be a place of hope, a place of prophecy, a place where people discover life. And our aim and our heartbeat with everything that we do here is that again, that it is a place where people discover that God is indeed good. Turn your name and say, God is good. Can I have the band come forward, please? That God is indeed good. And therefore what we're asking you to do in this process, particularly as we approach Easter, but every week, is that you would simply love serving by number one, looking at the needs of your family, your members, your friends, your relatives, your neighbours. And going, how could I be Jesus to them? And then that part of that pathway of winning them to Christ can be literally this. Again, the Great Commission wasn't just to win them in a moment. It was to make disciples. It was to bring them to the house of God. Uh, what other king? Thanks. It was to bring them to the house of God. That they might experience a place not of judgment, but a place of some of the most amazing people in the world who carry that love of God to each other, to the new regardless of their past, regardless of whatever. We don't just, we take them in a moment. Take you as you are. But the other thing that I'm asking of you in this is that you would join the mission of what it is to recreate what we do here week in, week out. We obviously have a range of people who are already serving. But I know in my heart, I know that part of the pathway of making disciples, of seeing you be following Christ, is asking you to live a life of service. And I'm asking you that again, that if you have space, that if you have time in your world to commit to serving here on one of our teams, and the simplest way that you can do that to initiate that process is what I'm gonna ask you to do even now is to grab hold of this card, the volunteer card. And I'm gonna ask you to go through it if you haven't already. You may have done this last week and thank you if you've already done that. But if you've not yet done this, can I ask you to grab hold of this card, obviously to put your contact, de- your name and contact details on the front and on the back to actually begin to answer the survey and, and to look at well, how could you be involved here? Our heart is that, that there is a sense that we share the load here, that, that it's not just reliant on a handful of people. And we're really blessed right now. I think it's somewhere in the range of 56% of our church are involved in serving. And we want to ask, let you know too that in that we value serving in our local community. Yes, we're asking you to serve here, but we appreciate if you're serving in chaplaincy and mentoring, if you're serving somewhere else in our community, we value that as well. Highly value that as part of serving. So what I'm going to ask you to do in a few minutes, or if you haven't already, is to fill that out. And then um, at the end of when I'm about to pray for all our team leaders, at the end of that, some of our team leaders are going to go through the aisles and they're going to collect these cards if you're filling them out today. If you're someone who's already been volunteering and you haven't filled this out, we'd really appreciate it. There's a section down the bottom left of the card. Bottom, sorry, right of the card. The bottom right of the card, if you could fill that out as well. We'd love to know where you're at in your volunteering. So I'm gonna ask all the team leaders if you could begin to make your way down the front because I wanna pray for them. 
Our team leaders carry the responsibility of, of making all our rosters work, of making all our time frames work, of, care, of not just asking you to fulfill a role, but then doing life with you, caring for you, praying for you. I know our team leaders do such a sensational job of caring for their teams. Yep, keep coming down the front, team leaders. Hey, if you're online, I'm gonna bring out, we're about to bring this service to a close. We wanna thank you. If you would like to be involved in serving in some way, shape or form, there's even ways that you could be involved in serving online. If that's you, we would love it. If you, again, could just shoot us a note, you might wanna inbox us here at C3 Church, Devonport, and say, hey, I would love to find a way to, even from my distance, be able to serve C3 Devonport. Please feel free to, again to ta- put a comment or just send us an inbox and say, I would love to serve. Thank you so much. But for all of those, again, if you are online, we're going to say goodbye to you now. God bless you. Thank you for joining with us again. And we'll see you sometime soon. Good morning, church. We hope you're having a wonderful day today. We've got some birthday to start off announcement this morning. And we have Fiona Hannafin and Isabella Inge's birthday this week. So give them a round of applause. Happy birthday. And also for wedding anniversaries, we have Erin and Travis Cruz of six years. And we have Julian David Robertson of 30 years. So congratulations. Congratulations, guys. Awesome. And we have connect groups this week. Um, So make sure that you get to your connect group leaders, message them and find out what's happening, where you're meeting. And yeah, get along to connect groups this week. Yeah, because you don't want to miss out. Also, tonight, right here in this building, we have Vaulted Youth on. And it's the last for the term. So you really don't want to miss out on that. Not only that, but Daniel West is preaching. So be here from 6 to 8. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a blast. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. And Easter. Easter is next week. Can you believe it? What? Oh, my goodness. So make sure that you're registering for that um, through, through Eventbrite. And yeah, invite your family and friends along next week. Yeah, because spots are filling up fast. Yeah, we're almost full. So make sure to do that this week. Awesome. All right. Thanks, guys. See ya. Hey, thank you for joining us in the experience that we call C3. Maybe today you've made a decision to follow Christ, to become a believer, to become a Christian. If that's you, we would love it if you would just do one more thing for us before this service is out. And that is to go to www.c3churchdevonport.com forward slash online. It'll be appearing on the screen. If you could go to that link and click the button that says take the next step. We'd love it if you would fill out your contact details there. Uh, and one of us will be in contact with you because we would love to pray with you, answer any questions you might have, uh, and to encourage you though in this incredible life-changing decision that we believe is one of the greatest decisions that you can make on, on this side of heaven. Yeah, absolutely. And we would love to, for you to feel like you belong in a place where that's watching us online or in a service. So we would love you to jump on again that same website and you can choose Get Connected and we will be able to give you some more details on how you feel like you can belong because we really believe that there's a place for everyone where they fit and where they belong. And maybe you've got any other questions regarding C3, you can find links there where you can send us in your questions and ask for more information. You can make a prayer request. Yeah. Hey, if maybe you're watching here today and you're actually someone who lives within driving distance of Devonport. We would love to invite you to come and actually join us here in our physical location here every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. You are more than welcome to come and connect with us. At this stage, we still do ask you to register your intention to come. It's just what the government is still asking us to do. But we would love to invite you that you might come and experience what we call the C3 tribe, the C3 family. So thank you again for joining with us today. God bless and whatever it is that you're doing this week. See you next week. Awesome. Bye.